Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, at whatever time you're watching this presentation, thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Kazakri. I'm the coordinator of financial aid at Fulton Montgomery Community College. And myself and my colleague. Hi, I'm Moira Samick, and I am the financial aid advisor here at FM. And we are here to speak to you virtually about what you need to know about financial aid. Uh, we are going to go over this presentation and um, there will be an opportunity at a later date to get on to a call with us to ask some questions. But right now what we would like to do is go over the whole financial aid process um, to help answer questions that you have regarding applying for financial aid for your students for the 21-22 academic year. So let's get started. What do you need to know about financial aid? Some of the topics we're going to discuss today is what exactly is financial aid and some terms, cost of attendance, what exactly does that mean? Expected family contribution, how do we know what to expect from you as a family? Financial need, categories, types, and sources of financial aid. What is that FAFSA and some special circumstances? So our first question, what exactly is financial aid? Financial aid consists of funds provided to students and families to help pay for their post-secondary educational expenses. It's made up of several categories um, and we'll go over each and every one of those. But what we'd like to do first is let's talk about some of the definitions that uh, financial aid offices use. And you'll start to see um, in, in information that you get back and forth from the colleges. So what exactly is a cost of attendance? A cost of attendance is a uh, number that financial aid offices use to determine the total cost of college for your student. It's made up of five uh, different uh, factors, tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, transportation, and miscellaneous expenses. These costs, some are direct expenses, which means they are actually directly billed to you tuition and fees, and room and board for those students who live on campus. Books and supplies are always an indirect cost, which means that you might be paying the bookstore, so you might not be paying the college directly for those. Transportation, back and forth to school, depending on where you go, and miscellaneous personal expenses. Those expenses um, are things that will come up all the time that you're in school. So we build that into the cost of attendance. The next definition is what is the expected family contribution? How do we know what is expected from you to determine a financial aid package? Well, the, the EFC, expected family contribution, is the measurement of the students and family's ability to pay for their post-secondary educational expenses. It's made up of two factors. One is the student's contribution and the other is the parent contribution. So we take all of those numbers um, where we use the FAFSA to come up with that and those that becomes the number that we use to determine what types of aid you're eligible for. So how do we determine financial need? How is it what we know what you need to go to school? We take those two definitions, your cost of attendance, we subtract out the expected family contribution, and that's where we come up with a number called financial need. What we then do as a financial aid office is we try to build the financial aid package to equal that financial need. So for instance, um, let's take an example of a college that costs $25,000 and you have an expected family contribution of $5,000. You then have $20,000 in financial need. So we as an office try to determine a financial aid package based on that $20,000 in financial need and build that financial aid package to fulfill that financial need number. The categories of financial aid, um, to go back to that, that $20,000 in need, we try to build the financial aid package based on two types of financial aid, need-based aid. So um, going back to that example of the $25,000 school minus the $5,000 EFC, you have $20,000 in need. We start to build the package with need-based aid, such as a Pell Grant. 
TAP awards, subsidized student loans. Then what happens is we take a look at non-need-based aid, um, unsubsidized Stafford loans, things that you could receive as a student, even if you didn't have any financial aid or financial need. So for instance, if we go back to that, that um, equation of cost attendance minus EFC, if you had a $20,000 institution but you had a $25,000 expected family contribution, you would have no financial need, but you could receive different types of aid um, that are not need-based, such as scholarships. And again, the unsubsidized Stafford loan. Next. So now I'm gonna talk about the different types of aid that you can receive after you complete the FAFSAs. Go ahead, next. We'll start with scholarships. Scholarships are um, funds that a student can receive based on merit. Um, they can apply through your local high schools, guidance counselors, and also the colleges. Everyone has, um, there are also local resources too that you can apply to scholarships. You can research those. Some safe scholarship um, research websites that you can go to are uh, hesc.ny.gov. College Board also has some scholarship information out there. Again, I would touch base with your guidance counselors and your local newspapers for scholarship information. Scholarships can be awarded, again, based on need and merit alone. Next. Next is grants. Grants come in the form of a Pell Grant, um, there's the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant that the colleges are funded and able to provide to students to help pay for college. Grant aid is money that does not have to be paid back. Those are funds to help you with your college education. Next. Work, study, and employment. That's a job on campus. Some students um, will say that they don't want to work while they're going to school. However, work study is an opportunity on campus to make a connection with someone. Uh, they can earn a paycheck while working in between classes and studying. They can also, some schools will put that work study money towards your tuition and fees bill um, if you're working towards that, depending on the, how the school does that. Next. And loans. Loans come in three forms. There's the two student loans, the subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan. The subsidized loan, the government will pay the interest while you're going to school. The unsubsidized loan, the interest accrues, or you can pay the interest quarterly if you choose to, but that loan will grow as you're in school. Then there's the parent plus loans. The parent plus loans are for the parent to borrow money to help you cover the cost of your education. Uh, the loans can be deferred until the student is out of college. Um, there's a credit check for the Parent PLUS loan. And that's it, next. Some of the sources of financial aid um, are the federal government, which is the largest source. New York State um, has one of the most generous uh, uh, grant programs in the country. And some other things that we'll go into a little bit later. Your colleges and your universities, they have foundations and scholarships and all sorts of things um, that a student can apply for. And there are private sources, uh, scholarships like Moira was discussing that you can research and you can um, you know, check the local papers and, and check websites and all kinds of things to find <clears throat> those private sources. And then also your employers. Uh, for parents, you know, there is the opportunity that your union might have a scholarship that's available. My dad was a fireman, his union had a scholarship. I applied for the scholarship and got it. So what you wanna do is you wanna look in every resource you have available to see if there is something out there to help your student apply for some type of financial uh, help for college. Next. 
So just to go over some of these sources um, a little more, uh, the federal government, large, largest source of financial aid, federal Pell Grants, federal student loans, both subsidized and unsubsidized, um, SEOG, work study, all those types of, of grants and uh, work options are from the federal government. So they are our largest source of financial aid. The aid, although, is pro provided primarily on the basis of financial need. So we go back to that equation again of cost of attendance minus expected family contribution equals financial need. You must apply each year using the FAFSA. So you have to file that, that FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, every year available in October. Um, and uh, we'd like to remind students that it is a free application. Please do not pay anybody to complete these applications. Uh, we are your source um, for questions. If you have any questions as you go through the FAFSA, you can always ask us, doesn't matter if you're coming to FM or not, although we would love to have every single one of you here. Um, we do offer um, our services for questions as you go through that process um, until it gets college specific. Um, but if you have a question on the FAFSA, you can always give us a call. Um, and there are eligibility requirements that must be met for any federal grants. Next, please. Some of your federal student aid programs, like I mentioned before, your federal Pell Grant, uh, the Iraq Afghanistan Service Grant, SEOG, <clears throat> Teach Grants, Federal Work Study, Direct Loans, Parent Plus Loans. All of those are options for students to um, tap into, but you must file the FAFSA. Next, we'll go on to New York State. New York State has several uh, grant programs available, the biggest one being the Tuition Assistance Program, or otherwise known as TAP. New York State TAP does have a residency requirement. Not only does the student have to live in New York, but so do the parents. The parents must be a New York State resident. The aid may be provided based, the, the New York State TAP award is, awarded based on merit and need. A student must keep uh, academics and GPAs in order to keep the New York State Award from semester to semester. They do use the information from the FAFSA um, and it links right into the TAP application only if your student is choosing a New York State school. So you'll see the link at the bottom at the end of the FAFSA application that you've put a New York State school on your application and it will link all the information to the TAP application. If your student indicates that you are not a New York State resident or they're not a New York State resident or they don't choose one of those schools, you will not see the TAP link automatically until one of those items happens. Deadlines vary state by state. New York State TAP, you can't take to a different state it is only eligible to be used at a New York State school. The deadline for New York State TAP is actually not until June 30th of 2022 for this academic year that we're looking at tonight. Next. This is the website, hesc.ny.gov. When you apply for New York State TAP, this is going to be where you're going to look for all the information. You'll also see some different things on here, the DREAM Act, the Excelsior Scholarship. But please note, due to the pandemic, there are some um, possible issues with the funds that might not be available in certain, at certain times. So the applications for all of those grant funds will be on this website. And they do and will email you an alert when those applications become available. For example, the Excelsior Scholarship application this year was not available until August and it had a deadline of August 31st. So that is time sensitive to apply for. So you always have to stay alert and on top of things. And like I said, you can put your email in on their website to get those alerts in a timely manner. Next. Another source of aid that we discussed a little bit earlier are the colleges and universities. They can provide scholarships uh, based on merit and need. They can, some of them have endowment funds that you can apply for, or each college may have scholarships that you can apply for also. 
every school chooses their own application deadlines for those. So check with the colleges that your student is applying for to see what is available for you there. Next. Private sources, also um, a good idea to check with different foundations, businesses, churches, charitable organizations in your local area. They may have their own application process and procedures and deadlines. Begin researching these private sources now. This is a good time to reach out to those uh, organizations to see when their applications will become available and when their deadlines are and what's needed. An essay, an application, uh, letters of recommendation, all of those items um, you'll wanna start gathering at this time. Next. And employers. Again, check with your parents to see if their employers may have some scholarship opportunities for your children. Also, some of the um, children locally I know here who work at McDonald's or Price Chopper, sometimes um, they have scholarships available to their own employees um, that the students can receive. So if your child is working, make sure that they check with their employers also to see if they can benefit from any scholarships there. Next. Okay, so the big um, <clears throat> question is always the FAFSA. The free application for federal student aid. Again, we like to focus on free. Please do not pay anybody to complete this application. We are here to help you. So what exactly is the free application for federal student aid? It is a form that collects demographic and financial information for both you, the parent, and the student. Um, to determine and calculate the expected family contribution. The colleges use the EFC to offer financial aid. So whether it's any of the need-based aid or it's any of the non-need-based aid, we use that those numbers to determine the financial aid package. The form is available in English and in Spanish. Next. The form may be filed at any time during an academic year, but no earlier than October 1st, prior to the academic year for which the student is requesting aid. Uh, that's a mouthful. So this October 1st, the FAFSA became available for the 21-22 academic year. And you will be using the tax returns from 2019 to complete the FAFSA. Um, and colleges may set their FAFSA priority deadline date uh, so you want to double check with all of the schools to make sure that you're filing that FAFSA when the school needs that to be done. Next. The free application for federal student aid can be filed several ways, FAFSA on the web, which is an online. My FAFSA being uh, via the student aid mobile app, which we were um, working with last year and is very user friendly. Um, I actually like the app better than the website. So um, if you have, if you can download the app and it's very easy to use on a phone or a tablet, the My Student Aid app is a very nice way to complete your FAFSA. There is a paper FAFSA, although it's very difficult to get. Um, the high schools do not have it, we don't have it. Uh, so if you need and want to complete the FAFSA on paper, you need to contact the Department of Education. They will mail it to you and then you will mail it back to them. But please be aware that anything that you do on paper for the FAFSA will take six to eight weeks to process. And um, so, they, so they really don't want you doing things on paper. They would much rather have you do it online. Uh, paper takes uh, much longer to process everything through. FAFSA on the phone, I can honestly say I've never um, done a FAFSA on the phone. Um, although I have had a couple students say that they've done it. And then FAA access to CPS online is a, it, um, uh, something that we use in our financial aid offices uh, to help students make corrections and those kinds of things. Next. Benefits of using FAFSA on the web or the My Student Aid app, built-in edits to prevent costly errors. And what that means is, is when you're doing a paper FAFSA, you're putting in numbers. Um, and sometimes some of the questions can be a little tricky um and uh for instance one of the common errors that we saw in the paper fafsa is, is that it was asking for your adjusted gross income and then it was asking for your taxes paid but for a while it was that question kind of um was a little confusing and people were putting in their adjusted gross income 
as the same number as their taxes paid. Um, so what happens is with the facts on the web or the my student aid, those edits will say to you, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. And they will have you fix that. So that is a, a, um, a nice edit to help you um, not make an error that could really shift the expected family contribution um, in a way that, that might change a financial aid package if that number was wrong. There's some skip logic that allows students and parents to skip unnecessary questions. Any question you can skip on the FAFSA is a good question. And then there's the option to use the IRS uh, data retrieval tool, which helps you bring in your tax returns to into the FAFSA. Next. Some more benefits, more timely submission of the original application and any necessary corrections. And what that means is when you file the FAFSA and you do it online or via the web, or via the app, then it takes five to seven days to process that FAFSA. So the colleges will start to receive that FAFSA very shortly after you complete it. Anything you do on paper, like I said, can take anywhere from four to six, potentially eight weeks to process. So if you send in the signature, that could take four to six weeks to process. If you send in the FAFSA, the entire application, that could take longer. And then what happens is there are more detailed instructions and help for the common questions. So if you have a question um, on the FAFSA, all you have to do is, is click the helpline and it will bring up all of the um, potential answers to that question. You have the ability to check the application status online. So you file the FAFSA at noon on a Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, you can go on to the FAFSA website and see, has it been processed? Are you missing a signature? Did something go wrong? And then that way you can check that and you can fix that error very quickly. And then there's a simplified application process in the future. So that's called a renewal FAFSA. And the, the next year that you go to do the FAFSA, most of the information will be in there already. And all you have to do is update all the tax information. So that makes it very quick and, and hopefully very easy. Next. This is just a picture of the FAFSA on the web website. Um, you can enter the FAFSA as a new FAFSA um, or a returning user to do the renewal application. And the website is right there. Please make sure you go to the studentaid.gov website. There are some sites out there um, like fafsa.com that will actually charge you to file the form. At any point in time that a, a, a website is asking you for a credit card to complete the FAFSA, you are on the wrong website. So you gotta make sure that you go to studentaid.gov and complete the FAFSA. You can enter the FAFSA. This was a, a new feature a couple years ago, either as the student or as the parent. So the parent can actually start the FAFSA um, for the student um, or your student can start it. But eventually at the end, everyone will need to sign it. So we just, uh, so we wanna make uh, or show you that you can start the FAFSA either as the student or the parent. Next. This is the My Student Aid app. Like I said, it's very user friendly. Uh, we do suggest that if you have a tablet or a phone that you download this app. Um, it's actually kind of cool. Um, if any part of this process is cool, this mobile app is kind of neat. So um, we do uh, suggest that it is very safe um, and it's very user friendly, like I said. Next. Some more information about uh, the mobile app. It's protected. The same as FAFSA on the web, it prompts the applicant to create a save key, uh, which is just another level of protection, allowing completion at a later time. So you can save some things. Um, if you have a question on some of the items, then you can go back to it and you'll just have to put that save key in there. Next. There is um, an agreement and of terms in the check checkbox, um, and that just talks about you know not um, making sure that everything is true and correct on the form. There is a confirmation of submission, and then it actually gives you an estimated EFC calculation. And what that estimated EFC calculation says to us is: Are you eligible for pe federal Pell grants? Are you eligible for a subsidized or an unsubsidized Stafford loan? So it will give you a preliminary idea of some of the. The, um, the grants and, and loans that you could potentially be eligible for. 
Next. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the IRS data retrieval tool. And some will ask, why do I need to use this tool? Why would I use this tool if I have my tax returns in front of me? Um, the data retrieval tool actually allows for you to bring in your tax information directly from the IRS database. So what will happen is, is if you link to the IRS database using the data retrieval tool, it will ask you for your address and your filing status on your taxes. And then it'll allow you to transfer the information that is required for your FAFSA over to the individual questions. And you'll notice if you use this, every question that is brought in, it will say transferred from the IRS database. So you'll know that it is accurate and correct and you won't have to make any changes or guesses as to what needs to be in those line items. You do not have to participate, it is voluntary. Um, however, it will allow you to uh, bypass documents that the financial aid offices may request if you're chosen for the process of verification. So just keep that in mind. If you utilize the data retrieval tool, it saves you time and saves the amount of documents that might be requested by each financial aid office that you are applying to. Next. Certain individuals or tax filers cannot use the IRS data retrieval tool. So this gives you some that can't, um, if you indicated on your FAFSA that you didn't file a tax return yet or your tax return was not completed, uh, you can't use the data retrieval tool because there's not a tax return to pull in from. If your marriage date is January of 2020 or later, you won't be able to pull in two tax returns because now that you're married, you and your spouse will have to combine your income manually on that FAFSA application. And it won't let you, let us pull in those two tax return info. Uh, it won't put, let us pull the documents in from the IRS on the two tax returns. If the first three digits of your social security number are 666, we haven't run across that yet, um, filed a non-US tax return. If you're married and filed a head of household or filed married separately, again, it can't pull two tax returns in at once, so it won't allow that. So you'll have to manually enter each line from both of those tax returns and combine them. Neither married parent entered a valid social security number or non-married parent or both married parents entered all zeros for their social security number. You won't be allowed to use this data retrieval tool. Next. Another important item that you'll need for your FAFSA and the completion of your FAFSA is the FSA ID. So you'll need to apply for your FSA ID and you can do that right on the application site or the mobile app. This allows access to certain US Department of Education websites, studentaid.gov one, for one example. This may be used by the students and the parents throughout the financial aid process and for future years. Every year that your student is going to college, they will need to complete the FAFSA or apply for student aids. They'll need to have an FSA ID. And you can apply at fsaid.ed.gov. An important note on that is make sure that you're using your personal email addresses. Don't use your school address or your work addresses, um, email addresses for your FSA ID. If um, some of the school's email accounts will lag out or they'll um, deactivate them and you will need this uh, email address over time. So if you have to recover a password or things of that nature, you'll need to be able to access your email and parents, same thing. So you can't use the same email for the parent and the student. Each one needs an individual personal email account that you can have access to on a regular basis in case you need it for any um, of the financial aid processes. Next. There is a FAFSA on the web worksheet available. 
that you can preview the questions um, that are on the FAFSA if you wanted to look at them beforehand before you start the process. You're more than welcome to go to the student aid website studentaid.gov website and look and review and possibly even print that out if you'd like um, to get a head start just so you can kind of grasp at what they might be asking you um, on the application itself. And some next, some general student information that you'll need uh, when completing this form, you're going to need social security numbers citizenship status, marital status, any drug conviction or possession of sale, um, selective service registration for our male students who are 18 or older, highest education level completed by your parents. Some other things to note when completing um, the FAFSA on the web is make sure you're always paying attention to the blue ribbon at the top of the screen. It will indicate what it is looking for or who it is looking for information based on either whether it's the student information or the parent information. So make sure you always review the top of the screen before filling out the information that's on that particular screen so you can see who they're asking the questions for, whether it's the student or the parent. Next. And another section on the FAFSA talks about the student dependency status. We often have a lot of questions about um, a student where a parent will say to us, okay, my child is 18, they're moving out of the house, and uh, they're going to be independent. Well, according to the FAFSA and according to the Department of Education, you have to meet certain requirements in order to be an independent student. Um, some of those requirements are they have to be old, over the age of 24, married, have um, support children of their own or support someone else, uh, be a veteran of the US Armed Services um, or an orphan or a ward of the court. Um, so there are some dependency questions and if your student answers no to all of those questions, they are a dependent student and it is required to have parent information on the FAFSA. And when we say parent information, we mean either the biological parent or the adoptive parent. Um, some students might live with a grandparent, grandparent claims them, their information does not go on to the FAFSA. That is a student that we would talk to about potentially being um, a special condition, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. If a student answers yes to any question, any of the dependency questions, they are independent, and we will look at that FAFSA based on their income and assets alone. Next. So information about parents of dependent students, we need the tax information, income and other financial inf information such as uh, assets, uh, cash savings and checking accounts, do they own their own business that has more than 100 employees, um, their dislocated worker status, a receipt of means tested federal benefits in the previous two years, uh, free reduced price lunch, um, WIC benefits, those types of, of items. We need to know about assets, any assets that you own um, that do not include your primary residence. So these are our items like vacation homes, rental property, other types of real estate, and any untaxed income that you have. So do you have anything? Um, are you paying into a 401k or 403b? That will be on your W-2. They'll want to know about that information as well. Next. Information about the student. Uh, again, tax information, income information, other financial information, their dislocated worker status, any receipt of means-tested federal benefits, their assets, their untaxed income. So very similar. Next. Some additional information um, that goes on the FAFSA is college information. You can put up to 10 institutions on the FAFSA and there will be a, a search bar in there so that you can find um, school codes for, um, for the, the schools that your students are looking for. Um, and if you have more than 10, what you wanna do is put the first 10 on there and then once the FAFSA is processed through, you'll go back and you'll change some of that information. Um, you'll change the, the school code so that the next set of schools can get the, the initial FAFSA. Just be aware that if you ever make any corrections on the FAFSA, 
only the schools that are on your FAFSA at that time um, who are listed on there will get those changes. They also want to know about your housing plans. Do you plan on living on campus, off campus, in an apartment, or at home? And then also FAFSA preparer information. So this is somebody, if they prepared the FAFSA for you, they have to sign off on that so that we we know or, or the, the Department of Education knows um, who did that in case there is a question on anything on the FAFSA. Next. So signatures required, um, always the student and at least one parent. Um, and it could be either parent, um, but you do have to create the FSA ID. And then there's a format for submitting signatures, electronic um, using the FSA ID, a signature page. But again, remember, it takes four to six weeks to process any signature. And then um, the paper FAFSA that they sign. And Moira, you have some information about signatures. Yeah, so on the electronic signatures, you have to make sure that um, when you get there, that's the FSA ID. So if you're not using the FSA ID or you save it, uh, this, the actual application, anytime you save it, if you leave it for a period of time, so in other words, if a student starts it and for some reason forgets and tries to go back in 45 days later, that fast was completely wiped out. Anything that they've done in their 45 days prior will be wiped out um, if it hasn't been submitted. So keep that in mind. Also, when you do the signatures, also when, if you choose something other than the FSA ID electronic signature as your signature, it does take longer to process. Um, you have to mail in the signature page and it can take, and if you don't do it within the 14 days that they require, again, that will wipe out everything and you'll have to start again. So it is very important to make sure that you have the FSA ID electronic signature so that way it can be processed um, in a timely manner for you. Next. Some frequently FAST, uh, FAFSA errors that we see are social security numbers. Again, that goes back to the ribbon at the top of the FAFSA application. Make sure you're always looking to see whose information they're looking for. So sometimes the parents will put their social security numbers in for the students or if they're doing multiple children, they're mixing up the social security numbers for their children too. So always make sure that the social security numbers are correct for the individuals that they are looking for. Divorced, widowed, or remarried parent information. So at this time, when you go and put on the application, it's at the time that you're filling out the application, if a parent is divorced or widowed, then you put on the parent that supports you 51% of the time for that year. Those are that that information is going to be that parent income, that parent's name, date of birth, everything goes on there. If that parent is remarried, your step parents' information and tax information must be included on that. They are now a family unit. So you need to make sure that when you're doing this correctly, if your parent is remarried, you do also include the step parents' income information. Income earned by parent and step parent. I just went over that. That does need to be included. Untaxed income, um, people forget that they had that and then they missed that piece about the W-2 form, box 12, uh, payments into your pensions or 403Bs. Uh, U.S. income taxes paid. Becky went over that a little bit about how uh, if you're manually entering your income information on the FAFSA application, sometimes they'll duplicate the income, the AGI, the adjusted gross income for your taxes actually paid, and that should give you an error message. Household size only include those individuals who live in the household of your parent that they support. So it would be yourself, your parent, and any other siblings that your parents might support. Number of household members in college, it's going to be at the time that you start college, how many other individuals in the household are attending college. This for the student cannot include the parent. So if the parent is going to college at the same time, you cannot be included in that number uh, on the student's FAFSA. However, when you're doing your own, your student can be included in yours. Real estate and investment net, net worth. Real estate is not your primary home or your residence that you live in. 
It is, again, vacation homes, rental properties, things of that nature, a piece of property, a land. Um, investment net worth is not your retirement funds. So don't put that information in there. It's not the worth of your retirement. Currently, your IRAs or anything of that nature, that would just be separate, like socks, bonds, CDs that you might have with a bank or, or things like that. Next. The FAFSA processing results. So what happens after you submit the FAFSA? It goes to the central processing system or goes through the central processing system and it will notify all the colleges after it's processed and it'll send the actual application to the colleges of your choice. And you, the student will get a student aid report also. So you can review all the items that you put in there, all the information. And if there are any corrections that need to be made, you can go log back in and make those corrections. Next. The email notification of the SAR processing, that's the student aid report. The student will receive this via email. You can print it out or you can access it on studentaid.gov by logging in using your FSA ID. Next. If you, um, the, the student aid report can also be sent to you um, by paper. If the FAFSA is filed by paper um, without providing an email address, they will mail it to you. Next. The institutional student information or the ICER is what the colleges receive when we get that information from the C CPS, Central Processing System, we then will review it, request any additional documentation if you're chosen for the verification process, or we will then begin to provide you with an award package. Next. Making corrections on your FAFSA, if necessary, if you get that student aid report and you realize that you put something in the wrong line, please feel free to go on to that FAFSA and correct it. If it's something that you're chosen for verification for but, and you're submitting documentation to the colleges, please let the offices of the colleges take care of the corrections. Um, we will make those, we'll edit your FAFSA, we'll correct them based on the information that we have and we'll do that for you. Next. All right, so now you file the FAFSA, you've put everything in there, you've submitted it, <clears throat> and well, something changes. Um, those are called special circumstances. And we are, our, our financial aid offices have the ability to take a look at some certain situations and consider those special. So for instance, uh, conditions exist that cannot be documented on the FAFSA. So your parents are separated and um, it happened recently, and but yet they filed a uh, joint tax return. That would be considered with documentation provided um, a special circumstance that we could take a look at to potentially um, try to separate out the income um, and, and help that student to uh, make the picture look more like it is instead of what it was. Because remember, you're filing the FAFSA now for 21-22, which is a long time from now and things can happen between now and then. So we would like you to know that there is the ability to make some changes if we need to. What you have to do in order to uh, do a special circumstance is send a written explanation and documentation to the college's financial aid offices. So uh, most schools have a form that you'll fill out. You'll have to give us the circumstance and then document it. So if it was a job loss, we will we'll probably need a letter from your former employer. If there was a divorce or a separation, we might need uh, a copy of the separation agreement. A lot of times we don't need to know all the details. We just need to know that, um, that there are two separate addresses, um, that there is a, a formal separation agreement, those types of things. The college will review and request additional information if necessary. 
And they do put this in here that decisions are final and cannot be appealed to the US Department of Education. Financial aid offices have been given um, what they call um, uh, professional discretion uh, to be able to take a situation, review it and see if there's something that we can do. Um, and from school to school, that decision could be different. Next. <clears throat> So like I was talking, some of the special circumstances that do exist, a parent or a spouse death, unfortunately, a loss of employment, unusual un uncovered medical or dental expenses, extraordinary dependent care, divorce, student cannot obtain, well, let me go back to that, secondary school tuition. Um, and again, these are not um, uh, exclusive. There are special circumstances, especially now, um, that are happening that if there is any change in your income from the time that you file the FAFSA until the time that your student goes to school, double check with the school um, to see if there's anything that they can do. Now, the student that cannot obtain parental information, that is a different situation where we take a look at a student who might not be living with their parents by no choice of their own. So there were some pretty severe situations that took that student out of their parents' um, care. Uh, that's called involuntary dissolution of the family. We can potentially look at that student as an independent student and only use their information, but we have to document that. Um, so we'll be asking for types of documents um, that are very sensitive, unfortunately, to be able to say, okay, that if, if your parents are not there, then this is what we can do. Um, so that is a conversation that your student needs to have with the colleges. And if they have any questions about that um, or their guardian has any questions about that, you can always give us a call and we'll kind of walk you through that process of how we have to take a look at that. Next. At any point in time, if you have any questions, you can either call myself, I'm Rebecca, or Moira, and uh, we will answer any questions that you have regarding this process. Again, like I said earlier, um, we will answer any questions uh, about the whole process, whether or not you're coming to FM. We wanna make sure that you get these forms filed as correctly as possible, and we're here to help you with that. Now, the other thing that we will be doing is because this is virtual and it's taped and and uh, you may have questions on October 29th of um, 2020 at 12 o'clock, we'll be offering a Zoom meeting that you can um, join and we'll be able to answer any questions that you have over, um, over a Zoom call. Um, and also on November 10th at 6 p.m. So we'll do one in the afternoon and we'll do one at night. You can join both you know, join us at any point in time. We will be sending all of this information, um, not only to our website, but we will send it all to the guidance offices so you can talk to your, your students' guidance counselors. And um, they'll have all of the information about when we will be available. But like I said, you do have our phone numbers and you can call us anytime with any question and we will do what we can to make sure that you get through this process as smoothly as possible. This is a great time for your students. Um, it can be a scary time and we wanna make sure that you know that we are here for you. And with that, um, Moira, do we have anything else? I don't think so. Thank you for watching and please let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, and watch this over and over again. If you have any questions, let us know. Thank you. Um, and again, good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on what time you're watching us. Have a great day.